This story happened when I was 12 years old. It was summertime and temperatures quite often reached up to and slightly over 120 degrees outside. Needless to say I spent a considerable amount of time indoors, enjoying a comfortably controlled climate, away from school. My mother worked during the daytime for the majority of that summer. Consequently, I spent most of it alone, playing pogs, masturbating to the Mexican TV station, and sorting my Marvel Masterpiece cards alphabetically. A few weeks into my vacation and the calls began. The phone would ring around noon. The first few times I answered with a standard, hello, received no response and simply hung up. After two or three of these incidents I began answering all noontime calls in silence, slowly cupping my hand over the receiver, just listening. Silence. Just, nothing. I would hang up after a few seconds. The frequency of these calls began to increase as did their regularity. Two weeks later almost every afternoon I'd either ignore the ringing phone, or quietly pick up and listen. My mute answering tactic was partly psychological, partly investigatory, in an act of defiance I met this caller's silence with silence of my own, while attempting to gather any kind of auditory cues as to who this could possibly be. On rare occasions I could make out some background noise, the sound of a TV or even a quick bit of muffled breathing, but mostly just silence. At this time cell phones were the size of shoeboxes and extremely rare. I'd seen a photograph of one only once or twice before. It was years before caller ID, asterisk 69, feature on phones which would call back the last number you got a call from, so I had no resources to aid me in identifying who this was. I became convinced it must be a bored classmate cooped up inside their house, trying to entertain themselves by prank calling me, however the consistency of the calls began to push this into a new unsettling territory beyond conventional types of prank behavior, as five or six weeks had passed since the first few calls, and they were an absolute daily occurrence at this point. Creepy as this situation was, I never felt the need to mention it to my mother, neighborhood friends, or anybody else for that matter. There was nothing to say simply because nothing was being said, and this was also my opportunity to play the role of the protagonist in a sort of makeshift pre-teen whodunit, just what I needed to spice up a boring summer. Still, slight anticipatory pangs of anxiety began to set in every afternoon knowing the ring which would always come, followed by unsettling silence or stifled breath. I had begun to get very frustrated and this led to anger. It was bizarre. Why would this person call around the same time every single day and never say anything? I couldn't understand their motivation and it had gone on too long now. It wasn't funny. Sometimes I would pick up, stand and listen for three or four minutes in complete silence before hanging up, and it would always be me who disconnected first. If I didn't answer, they would continue to call back until I did. When I finally did, they wouldn't call back. Until the next afternoon of course. So after almost seven weeks of this, I answered the afternoon call with a moment of silence and then burst into a rage. I began insulting the caller, asking, what the hell is wrong with you? As I continued on my tirade I glanced at the clock. It was exactly 12.15 so I finished with something along the lines of, it's 12.15 in the afternoon on a Saturday in the middle of summer and you seriously have nothing better to do than this? You have no friends. You have no life, you're a loser. Goodbye asshole. After I'd hung up the telephone I became aware that my body was shaking. My adrenaline was pumping. I hadn't planned that, but I just didn't know what else to do. I had to try something. I was fed up with this situation, and I just let it out. It kind of felt good, and surprisingly nobody called the following afternoon. The next few days there were no calls either. In fact, from that point on the calls had stopped completely. I was shocked. I had shamed them into leaving me alone. I still speculated as to who it was or could be, and part of me regretted not cracking the case but my relief outweighed my curiosity. A few more days passed. No calls. I tried not to think about it too much and enjoyed the remaining couple weeks of my summer vacation. School started up again. 
After a few weeks of good old-fashioned homework, bullying, and camouflaging my spontaneous erections in class, the whole creepy collar thing pretty much seemed relatively unimportant. I had a few thoughts now and then as to which kid it might have been, but it was complete speculation. I had never even heard the caller's voice, or really gathered any kind of clues as to who it might be so I let it go. Seven or eight weeks into the school year, I woke up early on a Saturday morning, proceeded to eat copious amounts of breakfast cereal, watch cartoons, then went outside to play, as the now bearable weather afforded me the opportunity to do so. Around noon I came inside to eat a snack. I still remember this moment fairly vividly. I sat at the counter in the kitchen where the phone was plugged into the wall, eating some kind of snack while my mother was washing a few dishes in the sink. The phone rang. Her hands were soapy, I was near the phone so I answered. I picked up the phone with a loud, hello. There were a couple seconds of silence and then an adolescent male's voice announced, Hey. It's me, your summer buddy. 12.15, remember? I looked at the clock and it was exactly 12.15. I was absolutely shocked. I couldn't say anything. I looked at my mother. She seemed to be oblivious to the fact that the phone even rang, as she looked intently down at the dishes she was now rinsing. I quickly hung up the phone. Hello, I just discovered this channel a few days ago and decided to share my own story. This happened last summer and started pretty much a year ago. I am a guy who spends quite a lot of time in front of my computer, probably too much, and my room back at my parents' place has a window facing the road in front of the house. My computer is located next to the window and when I'm sitting by it I have that window to my right side. This means that if someone walks past the house, they can see me by the computer and I often tend to look out the window whenever I see someone walking past in the corner of my eye. No big deal. So this all started when I noticed this woman, somewhere in her twenties, maybe early thirties, walking by quite often. As in five to ten times every day. No big deal of course, she probably just lives nearby I thought, which I later found she did. This woman had a very uncomfortable look to her. It didn't look like she had a shower in a while and she had this extreme smile on her face, constantly, as if someone had stapled her face into that expression. I didn't think much about it until I noticed that she started trying to make eye contact with me. Since she walked by my window so often, I often caught her in the corner of my eye and unintentionally looked at her. Every time she got eye contact she would start giggling slash laughing uncontrollably. This went on for a week or two. I just thought she was mentally ill or something, and didn't think much about it. Then one day, she walked past an insane amount of times, as in 15 to 20 times in a couple of hours and each time she was constantly looking into my window when walking by. This is when I started getting uncomfortable. After unintentionally getting eye contact again I quickly turn my eyes to the computer again only to see in the corner of my eye that she has stopped, standing outside my window and looking right at me, laughing uncontrollably with her creepy smile on her face. I quickly pull the curtains and try to ignore it when I hear the doorbell. I open the door and there she is. I'm alone at home and starting to get some serious creeps. I was at the time babysitting my friend's poodle and pick it up to use it as some kind of protection, stupid, I know. I say, hi. And she responds with a very, very happy, hello. She then says, now it's your turn. I have no idea what she wants and only respond with, okay. She then starts laughing, a lot, as if she just heard the best joke of her entire life. I start panicking and shut the door after quickly telling her to leave. I tell my parents when they come home and it turns out that this woman is an old student of my mother. She says that she is mentally ill and that I shouldn't worry. She is nice. Her visits outside my window continue every day and I tell my parents again that I feel uncomfortable. They then try to talk to her, to see what's up. My mom asks her why she does it and she tells her that she and I have some kind of supernatural connection in our heads and that she and I have conversations with each other through some kind of telepathic way. We are made for each other, 
and madly in love. That's when my parents are getting concerned. Her visits continued on a daily basis and we visited the police to see what could be done. Their answer is that we can't do nothing because of stupid laws in my country. She often rang my doorbell but I had the sense not to answer. I noticed that as time went on, she got worse and worse mentally. She started to show aggressive behavior against my parents when they asked her to leave. I have actually never seen my dad so uncomfortable and overprotective as he was at this time, he was worried as well. One day something happened that was enough for me. It was Friday night and I was home alone. I was watching TV and heard strange noises from the street. I peeked out the window and there she was, outside my window dancing, screaming, singing and doing all kinds of strange things. I put all the lights out in my house and pretended not to be home, but I could still hear her. She was outside still. My neighbors ended up calling me several times, asking if I was okay and I said I was, but I wasn't, I was scared. My parents were hours from coming home and all I did was watch TV, pretending not to be home. She stayed for an hour or two before leaving and the week after, me and my parents decided to take action. We visited different mental hospitals, or whatever you call them, in my county and tried to tell them what happened, but there was one problem, they didn't have her as a patient and couldn't help us. Neither could the police. To make the rest of the story short, it has been way too long already, this continued for the entire summer and towards the end, she would often spy on our house, playing some sick game with a child she had started hanging out with. At this point, she was scared of us because she knew we had contacted the police and different doctors and they were shouting things such as, you see that house, watch out for them or they will call the police, run, and she, and the child, would run and come back minutes later, repeating the same thing. The police have visited our block several times, hunting her when she is clearly out of control. There are so many incidents I can tell you about this story, but it would take way too long to tell everything. I don't live at that house anymore and I haven't been bothered by her since, except the time she tried to contact me on Facebook, but she was blocked instantly. That was the worst summer of my life. Long time lurker, first time sending in my story, all that jazz. While I was a witness to a number of events with the individual in question, I would like to note that the majority of the unsettling behavior and stalking was directed to my co-worker and friend at the time, Caroline. She and I became close friends during the summer in question and while we have since gone our separate ways, we do keep in contact every now and then and after reading several posts on this sub, I asked if I could share the experience. She agreed, but out of respect to her, and to protect both of our anonymity, I will leave out some more direct details. Having witnessed the behavior firsthand on many occasions, I understand her hesitation and her terror. So on to it, this is going to be rather in depth since there were several encounters over the summer. It was a few years ago now, I lived in a medium-sized college town and worked at a nearby grocery store. It was small and had been in the community for years, so there were a lot of regulars. Some important backstory with the area. While the town was removed in a sense from the major city, there was a bus line that went directly from the larger city to this town and it just so happened to drop off right by our store. As it goes with some public transit, especially in this area, there were several homeless and transient people that got off the stop and would come to the first place with food and drink and a place to wait our store. I have had several creepy encounters with this place and may post some later. I worked at this store for almost a year and a half as a cashier then was promoted to supervisor. Caroline had been working there for several years before me, but we were about the same age, I am a male in my mid-twenties now. Caroline is a very attractive, friendly, and vivacious woman. She was a pleasure to work with and is a good friend. But she also attracted a lot of unwanted and unwarranted attention, especially during night shifts. Caroline has a good head on her shoulders and is an expert at dealing with the creeps and the leering jackasses. This guy he was a whole other story. It started in late June. I had come onto a shift, I usually worked closing shifts because of school schedule, 
and during a tag-up meeting with the morning supervisor, Megan, I was informed to make sure I hid the break schedule. Our store was small and yet still incredibly busy with the college and the local community so we had to balance schedules and breaks and tasks really well and things could change at a moment. We had a clipboard with the people on the front end for the day, and the estimated break schedule. It also had their in and out time. Supervisors were often also on registers and not just hanging out in the office so we were at ground zero as it were when things got crazy. I asked Megan why I had to hide it and she informed me that some guy had been hanging around and she had caught him twice leaning over the register to look at the schedule. Our store had a big cafe in the front, so it wasn't uncommon for people to linger, sometimes hours at a time. This was especially true for the homeless who had nowhere else to go. As long as they weren't causing trouble, we had no reason to kick them out. Anyway, as the night progressed, I noticed this lanky dude with incredibly thick and greasy hair sort of wandering around. He would walk up and down the aisles, then go to the cafe with nothing and sit and stare at the registers, then mosey on outside to the outside tables then repeat. After about two hours of this, I approached and asked if I could help. Expecting him to say no and to scarp her off, I was taken aback when he moved extremely close to me and asked, is Caroline working today? Per our policy, and I believe in some places, the law, we do not divulge schedules. I would usually answer if they were currently there, as sometimes we would work directly with vendors and had meetings. This guy was clearly not that and I had already had a handful of people want to specifically stand at Caroline's line and chat with her, leer at her, and prevent her from working. She was usually good about giving codes when a habitual creeper came in and I would give her a task to go in the back room and count inventory. I was on edge with this dude so I told him I could not divulge that information. He looked ready to spit on me, he was also a good six inches taller than me, though I could probably take him if push came to shove. But he left. I told Caroline about it later and though she didn't say anything, I could tell something about this one that set her off. She was quiet the rest of the night. Cut to about two weeks later. We're doing late night inventory so we're working way past closing time at 11 p.m. I have myself and two other relatively newbies working with me. There were other people from other departments doing inventory, but the bulk of it was on us. At around 1 a.m., while we are neck deep in counting, the store phone starts to ring. And ring. And ring. Normally, we wouldn't answer but I guess store management did and that was that. About five minutes later it rings again. Someone else answers. Then again. I didn't think much of it until it rang a fourth time and I picked up. I answered to say that it was past our operating hours and to try again in the morning. There was heavy breathing on the other line, and when I said hello, this raspy voice that was super familiar asked if Caroline was working. I said it was past hours and was about to hang up when he shouted. Tell me when Caroline works next, or I'm going to come down there and slice your fucking throat, asshole. Needless to say that pushed a line. I had no idea this was the same dude but I got a familiar chill. I immediately hung up, told management and we proceeded to call the cops. We had to do this a lot when drunk homeless people would wander in and steal or get violent, seriously, I have so many creepy encounters, but I feel they aren't right for this sub. We knew the local cop, Jim, would help so we had him come by and do a few patrols. That was about it. About an hour and a half later as we were wrapping up, the creepy dude is at the door, banging all unholy on the door screaming at us to let him in. There were about five other people near the door, all burly men and they chased him off. I called Jim and he said he would do another sweep. I told him the guy had come in earlier that month asking for the same girl. Of course after that, we made some changes. Caroline was notified. I may have had issues with some of the store management, but they were really good about keeping us safe. She requested day shifts only, which we tried to accommodate as best we could, but I didn't write the schedule and our direct team manager had the propensity to be an ass and would sometimes schedule people when they requested they couldn't work. 
She often paired me with Caroline since we were the fastest workers and could get the closing duties done early so they could save like 30 minutes on labor. Whatever. There were some other minor incidents I guess with him coming in, but he was quickly booted out by management. There was one incident where some dumbass on our team answered the phone and gave this dude Caroline's whole schedule for the week. We had been told not to tell the team why the guy was not allowed in, because it was private, but Caroline ended up telling them, much to the chagrin of our team manager, don't know why she was so pissed, Caroline was trying to get people to understand the gravity of the situation. When that happened he was there every day. I ended up trading some shifts with her as a cashier and not a supervisor, just so she could get some peace. After a few months of this guy really harassing her at work by lurking and waiting for her to get off, we all pitched in and walked her to her car or drove her home, or stayed with her until her boyfriend could come pick her up outside, it just kind of stopped. Really suddenly. Caroline didn't want to talk about it and I didn't press as even though we were close co-workers, it wasn't my business. So in about late August she's closing with me and we are having a good time as it was super slow that night. She offers to take care of some duties while I count drawers and close them out. A difficult and somewhat nerve-wracking process as I had to have the drawer of money out in plain view, the old store had really bad security in that manner, thank goodness we were never robbed when I was there. One of the seasoned cashiers stays on register to help any customers, while Caroline wipes down the cafe and does the normal closing duties. I to this day do not know what made me do what I did next, but I am partly glad I did, and partly terrified. Caroline was collecting the trash from around the front end and getting ready to take it out back. In the middle of the drawer being out with money ask you, I get this gut feeling something isn't right. I told her to stop, and that I would take the trash out. She gave me a weird look like I was saying she couldn't physically do it, which of course wasn't true. I just felt a sense of unease. She didn't complain, taking out the trash to the nasty dumpsters out back wasn't like a trip to Disney World after all. I threw the money back in the drawer and locked it, and grabbed the trash to take it out back while Caroline finished cleaning and Jesse was on the register. The alley where the trash went was pretty fucking awful. Smelled bad and despite our best efforts, was always messy. We shared it with a few other businesses and with the constant wave of homeless and transient, we had frequent dumpster divers. As I am walking down the loading ramp I hear some noises by the recycling dumpster, but I figured it was a raccoon or something as the alley ended near a big ditch slash ravine with a little creek. Raccoon City, really. As I am throwing away the trash, some figure darts out into the alley and blocks off the amber glow of the sodium lamp. I look up, startled. It's this dude. He was wearing a really large hoodie despite the warm weather, and had his hands tucked into the front pocket. His head was bowed slightly so he wasn't looking right at me but I knew instantly who it was. I will never forget that look of hunger and malice in his eyes. Like his obsession with Caroline had consumed every ounce of humanity in him and turned him sour. We hadn't had a problem in weeks and we were all under the impression he was gone, based on things Caroline had hinted at. This guy, saunters forward and asks if he can bum a cigarette. I don't smoke and clearly wouldn't do so on the job. Plus I had hands filled with dripping garbage bags. He knew I knew who he was so I don't know why he pretended to not know me. I told him he knew he was not wanted here and to leave, and that I was about to call the cops again. The movement towards me was so sudden, I barely had any time to react. Pouncing forward, hands jumped out of the pot and onto my shoulders, pushing me against the wall. His next words were throaty and pained, almost as if he was crying in anger. Are you fucking Caroline? She's mine. Keep your fucking hands off my woman. I shouted out of fear and anger I guess and the store manager who was in the back room heard it and came running outside. Dude bolted like a bat out of hell, down the ravine, and into the creek where we think he waded through the big pipe down to where there was a small park he could hide out in. I was so terrified and damn near had a panic attack in the back room. The store manager called the cops and told Caroline what had happened. She broke down and was sobbing uncontrollably. 
I called her boyfriend, Ian, and asked him to come get her, that she was okay to leave for the rest of the night and didn't need to finish her shift. Jin came out, did a look but couldn't come up with anything. The store leadership talked to Caroline a few days later I guess but she didn't want to talk much about the guy. We all got the sense something was up. I filed a report but my boss, the crappy team manager, told me I shouldn't make another one and definitely shouldn't press charges because it could come back to bite them in the ass legally, whatever the hell she meant by that. Caroline quit soon after. I don't blame her, none of us did. Despite mine and a few other managers' best efforts, she wasn't feeling safe at work and kept insisting there was nothing we could do. I didn't see her for another seven months, as she disappeared pretty much off the face of the earth and online. I know this is getting super long, but there is one last thing that really nails how twisted this guy was. Eventually, while running errands in the city on my day off, I bumped into Ian while out shopping. I asked him how things were going, as we had become rather friendly from the several times he came in to get Caroline. He said things had been better, and that Caroline was getting back to feeling safe. I didn't want to pry, but he let me in on what had been happening. Apparently the guy was an old friend of a friend of Caroline's. He had been at a party and met Caroline and had been really friendly, almost too much so. He friend her on Facebook and had kept rather quiet, messaging her here and there and wanting to chat. She made it clear she was dating someone and he seemed to ignore this and quickly got more aggressive in wanting to just hang out with her. Caroline didn't want to cause any problems with their mutual friend, so she didn't unfriend this guy but did do what she could to turn off chat so he couldn't bug her constantly. She tried to prevent him from contacting her without unfriending him, as she was sure this would really set him off. She, as I said, was very friendly and didn't want to cause any more problems. It didn't work. He had apparently kept sending her flowers and stuff to her house, calling from unregistered numbers, how he got her number, she still isn't sure, and sending almost half-hourly messages on Facebook. Then, he snapped. He went postal on her Facebook, tagging his name on pictures of any guy, including her boyfriend Ian, as himself. He would then post comments like, she and I are meant to be, give me the strength to kill him, in reference to some picture where she was kissing Ian, we will be together for eternity, etc. Really disturbing stuff. She blocked him. Her friend talked her out of getting a restraining order for a while, but she ended up getting one after he attacked me in the alley. And that's about it for this guy. I never saw him again after that night and I quit and moved out of the area a few months after Caroline did. Partly because I was disgusted with my team manager and her lackluster attitude towards the events, she laughed when I told her initially this dude came at me in the alley, and partly because I had had quite enough with crazy creepers. I visit that store now and then to see old friends and I hope I never see that disgusting guy ever again. The few people that I've told this story always laugh it off or tease me, but I swear in my life that it's true. I have always loved yard sales. In the summer when I have a free day, I'll often just drive around all day, looking for different yard sales, wasting my day away. About two years ago I was doing this, just driving around looking for yard sale signs, gradually going further out into the rural country and enjoying the scenery, having fun getting lost on the back country roads, you can sometimes find great yard sales doing this. I saw a yard sale sign off of the road, next to a big rock with something religious carved into it like churches have. I can't for the life of me remember what it said, God's Haven. Something religious, I can't remember. Anyways, I figure it's probably got some good stuff if it's a church organization, so I decide to go. I turn my new jeep down the long, narrow gravel driveway and the trees open up to a clearing with a really beautiful white house. They have long tables spread out with folded clothes, kids toys, etc., but nothing I was really interested in. There are probably 30 people milling about on the property, but they are all wearing these grey jumpsuits. Um, okay. 
The only other person that seemed to be browsing through their wares was this old man, whose truck was also parked there but we were the only ones, except for the grey jumpsuits. The woman at the makeshift table with the money box on it begins talking to me as I'm preparing to leave. I stride over to her for a friendly chat, and I notice that behind the house, there are probably ten or so small, grey buildings that grey jumpsuits are going in and out of. After some casual chat, she notices me staring. Yes, we all live here. It's great. Hey, would you like to come in and learn more? She had this crazy light in her eyes, and I attempted to mumble an excuse, when she nodded at three guys who had been arranging stuff on the tables, moving tables, etc., and they all came to stand around me. Really, come inside, we preach peace and the word of God, you'd really like it. She took my hand and kind of started tugging me towards the house, all the while these guys are following and I'm making weak protests. Then, the old man who's been browsing paperbacks, seems to take notice and comes up. He looks at the woman and says, sorry ma'am, we both really gotta be going. I don't think she's interested. The woman looks shocked, but let's go, and the guys step back. He's a scrawny old guy, and I'm a petite woman, but that badass old man grabs my arm and hustles me over to my jeep. As I'm thanking him and yelling back to the people to have good luck with their yard sale, he mutters in a low voice, you really need to get out of here. My hands are shaking, all the grey jumpsuits are just turned and silently staring at us, and I'm fumbling with my keys. The old man stands by my rolled down window and I fumble to start the car and try to back out of the narrow, gravel driveway. I tried to do a three-point turn, but my car slid down in the gravel into a shallow ditch next to the driveway and I'm panicking. Just take it easy, put it in four-wheel drive, he coaxes. I don't know how. I whisper frantically, I'd only had the jeep for a couple months at that point, and I had never had a car with four-wheel drive before, I figured I'd learn eventually. He calmly told me how to do it, and stood there guiding me as I finally got the jeep to stop sinking into the gravel and drove the hell out of there. I yelled a thank you to him, and he nodded before getting into his truck. I told my family and a few friends, who kinda laughed and brushed it off, saying they hadn't heard of any cults in this area. Probably just a church sale at one of the members' houses. I've driven around that area a little bit after the event, but haven't seen the rock sign thing again, though honestly, that day I drove pretty deep into rural country, had no idea what road or where I was, I just knew the general direction to drive in to get back to a main road and eventually find my way home. I think I may have escaped a cult that is kind of off the radar, but I swear to God it happened and thank God that old man helped me get out of there. Out of all the disturbing people I've encountered in my 18 years of living, this guy takes the cake. Background for this story, I live in a town with virtually no crime whatsoever and my subdivision is considered the nicest one, which isn't saying much because this whole town has nice cars, homes, things, whatever. Every spring, my subdivision hosts its annual garage sale, we aren't permitted to have them at other times. These things are a huge deal. I'm talking about advertisements throughout the town and a few towns over, some homes sponsored by companies, like Dick Sporting Goods, Gans, etc. Anyway, this weekend means that the neighborhood will be full of people that do not live there. This happened when all my friends and I were roughly seven or eight. The days leading up to the garage sales were pretty dull, mostly just spent deciding what to sell. The day before the sale started, my school sent home a letter to our parents stating that other parents had noticed a ratty red pickup truck driving around the neighborhood, and that if they saw it to bring the kids indoors immediately as no one recognized the driver and he did not look friendly. Our parents reviewed Stranger Danger, and we carry about our lives going to our neighbors' houses to see what they've got out. Sure enough, on the first day of the sales, this truck is driving all around the neighborhood and parents are calling other parents to inform them. Kids come inside, life goes on. Next day, my friends and I went back out and we saw a red truck but wasn't sure if this was it, lots of cars that don't belong there due to all the advertising. We decided it wasn't because the guy looked nice. 
He stopped at the house we were at and asked us if we were going to buy anything. We pointed out the purses and stuff we wanted and he said he would pay. Great. What a nice guy, we all thought. So after we talked to him for a few minutes, we said we had to go home and he asked where we lived. Again, thinking nothing of it, we said our street names and the colors of our houses. When I got home from a friend's house a few hours later, my mom ran to me, hugging me, and saying she's happy to see me. I ask what's up, and she tells me that she saw the red truck from the description and that some man came to the door asking if I was home because he wanted to know how I liked the purse he bought me. I explained it all to my mom and she freaked out and called everyone in the neighborhood to let them know. Eventually the weekend is over and no one sees the truck again. A few weeks later I was sleeping at a friend's house and we went to this little restaurant next to the golf course with her parents. The place has some practice holes and we went over to play while her parents talked to some friends they ran into. I noticed an older guy a few holes down and remembered he was the guy who paid for our stuff at the garage sales. I knew my mom was mad about him, so I ignored him. He came over a few minutes later and said he was sorry our parents were mad and that he wanted to make it up to us, and how about we all stop for ice cream. My friend and I were hesitant, and her parents must have seen us with him and they sprint out of the restaurant screaming for us to come back and for the man to go away. When I was about 13, I asked my mom for more details about the man, and it turns out he was wanted by the police a few towns over for being a pedophile and abducting three small children. It scared the hell out of me to know that my friends and I could have been among those kids. What do you know about the things you own? Things have stories, histories. Some of the stories, darker than you'd imagine. I bought, something. Brought it into my home. Or maybe Jane was meant to be part of this all along. We had just moved in. The house was a labyrinth of boxes, a minefield of sharp plastic and Lego, somehow a box of the damn stuff had broken and I was still stepping on pieces a week on. I'd just gotten a transfer at the office and we were looking forward to living in another city. It was just past summer and the leaves were turning a delicious auburn shade. Carla, my SO, took some time off work to settle our daughter, Jane, into her new school. New job, new city, new life. Things were just about perfect. The perfect clarity you get, like a flash of lightning in your life, just knowing that the thunder is inevitable. I'd always loved weekend markets, flea markets, second-hand clothes shops. And yard sales. Not anymore though. A windy Saturday found Jane and I at the last yard sale we would ever go to. I took in the familiar sprawl of furniture, clothes and appliances across the verdant yard. I smiled at the collection of baby clothes and toys strewn all about the yard sale, remembering the nightmare of hand-me-downs, sales and donations I went through to dispose of Jane's baby stuff. I ran my fingers through Jane's hair. She was going through what we affectionately called her mushroom phase, a short bob of chestnut brown hair planted firmly on her head. I gave her a kiss on the top of her head, and she reciprocated with a gap-toothed smile. She pulled away and started stalking the aisles of furniture in the faintly leonine manner that all young children demonstrate. I shook my head and started browsing the items on sale. It was only after I found myself slowly brushing my hand over the frame of a crib before the creeping wrongness of the entire sale just hit me. The lack of dirt on the wheels of the pram. The smooth lacquer on the crib, devoid of nicks and scuffs. I ran my fingertips over the ridges of the ornately carved J on the headboard. The crinkle of the sheets on a tiny mattress, too stiff to have been washed even once. There was something else here some hidden story to be told. The man in charge of the sale had seen better days. A scraggly beard adorned his chin and the smell of alcohol clung to him like a shroud. He looked up as I approached. He couldn't have been any older than me, but there was something about him, some deep aura of defeat around him, that left him stooped and old before his time. His eyes were glassy, half-focused, like those of a rotting fish. 
I was working up the courage to ask him about the baby gear when Jane came bounding up to me. She wasn't alone. My first instinct was that she was carrying someone else's baby, but I quickly realized that she had managed to find a huge doll somewhere in the yard sale. I bent over so I could look her in the eye. You've got enough toys, young lady, I admonished. But daddy, this one's got a big J on her dress. Just like me, J for Jane Wright, she countered quickly, thumbing the embroidered J on the doll's blue dress. I guess we can ask, I said, straightening up with a soft grunt. My joints weren't how they used to be. I was wholly unprepared for what I saw next. The man, almost totally expressionless before, had had his twisted up with conflicting emotions, equal parts fear and anger. Where did you get that from, he hissed, advancing on my daughter. I quickly stepped between the two, getting ready for a confrontation, even as Jane skittered backwards, clutching the doll to her chest. The man stopped short. Those dead eyes fixed on a point past Jane's shoulder. This is what you want isn't it? This is what you want. Take her then. Take her. The words were low and flat, spoken like a mantra. Jane needed no further invitation, she turned and fled towards the safety of our car. After making sure she was safe I turned back to confront our antagonist. He had disappeared. It was when we were halfway home that I realized that Jane was still holding on to the doll. Sometimes you wonder if there are moments in your life that feel like the first ascent of a roller coaster. That feeling of peace at the apex when the whole world seems to take a breath. And then, madness. I realized that the night that Jane brought the doll back was the last night I slept easily. The last night of peace. The top of the coaster. The next night, the rats came. Or rats. I never heard more than one. It was always the same tap of claws across the hard wooden floor. Slowly and deliberately. Click. Clack. Click. Clack. Sometimes I'd lie awake in my bed in the darkness, just listening out for the faint noises. Once or twice, I'd be half asleep when the soft clicking on the hardwood floor would be louder than usual. I couldn't shake off the image of a rat's twitching whiskers as it took in the smells of the bedroom where my wife and I were lying in bed. Our rat problem started at the same time Jane started her obsession with her new doll. I don't know why it took me so long to think about returning it to the guy from the yard sale, but by the second day she had it, she was bringing the damn thing everywhere. For breakfast. When she was watching TV. To bed with her. The worst thing was that it was one of those talking models, the ones which record things and play them back in a piping, eternally cheerful monotone. I'd catch her out of the corner of my eye, whispering to it and giving a little smile as she held it up to her ear to have repeated her words in that devilishly happy voice. I started laying out poison for the rats. It didn't seem like a full-blown infestation so I really didn't want to spend the money on a pest control company. I had no luck. The little mounds of brightly colored pellets remained undisturbed. The tapping at night continued unabated. Jane, on the other hand, withdrew into herself. One day, I came back to find that she had dumped all her toys into the closet, leaving the new doll on the bed. I only need one friend, she said, looking me straight in the eye. She spoke to us less and less. The normal wonder of being a child, slowly supplanted by a melancholic sullenness. The only time I saw her smile was when she was talking to that hideous thing. Having no luck with the poison, I opted to go for traps instead. Specifically, glue traps. I could get a bunch of them in a packet and they wouldn't take up too much space. I spread them around the house, the kitchen, and the laundry area. A slice of salami for bait. Remembering the tapping noise in my room, I told my wife to avoid the spot in front of the bed and put the last trap there. I was woken up by the familiar skitter of claws on the wooden floor. In the bedroom again this time, sounding even louder than before. Even through the haze of sleep, I could hear the little footfalls getting louder. It seemed like an eternity before the cautious steps faded out, 
to be replaced by the raspy sounds of the glue trap sliding around the floor. Gotcha, asshole, I remember thinking to myself as sleep took me back into its dark embrace. My triumph was short-lived. The early morning light only revealed a scuffed-up trap. The rat must have been bigger than I thought. I picked up the sticky cardboard and threw it into the bin on my way out of the room. My wife was already up, the smell of freshly brewed coffee beckoned from the kitchen. Jane was already awake. Sitting at the far end of the dining table and scowling at her breakfast. The brown hair of the doll just peeking out from under the table. She didn't say a word. I sighed. Carla and I would have to talk this out soon. Talk to Jane, maybe arrange for a session with a therapist. Deep in thought, my elbow nudged a teaspoon off the table. It hit the floor and bounced with a musical clang. I swore softly under my breath and got down on my hands and knees to pick it up. I wasn't prepared for what I saw under the table. My breath caught in my throat as I locked eyes with Jane's doll under the table. But staring into those soulless orbs wasn't the reason I felt the blood drain from my face. Jane had one hand propping the doll up. The other, the other hand was absent-mindedly picking at the thin layer of yellow glue on the feet of the doll. This story happened to me during the summer and I'm only deciding now to post about it. I kind of forgot it happened until I read about someone here who has had a similar encounter. So during the summer, I went to stay with a relative in Edmonton, Canada, for a working holiday. I got a job that was a 40-minute walk from the apartment I was in, usually I didn't mind walking to work but on this day it was particularly hot out and I just wasn't in the mood to walk so I rang the taxi company. They took my name and phone number, no problems yet. So I get into the taxi and we're driving along making small talk, then all of a sudden this guy, who's about twice my age, I'm 19 by the way, starts asking much more personal questions. He starts telling me that I'm very handsome and that I must get approached by women a lot, to which I reply, eh, no not really. Silence for a few seconds and then he says he assumes I'm a guy who doesn't like women but rather men. Which, fair enough, was true. Then he starts asking what my type is. At this point I'm feeling kind of awkward and just wishing the journey would go by faster. Then he starts telling me how he also likes guys, that he lives on his own and gets lonely and wants someone over for some fun. I got kinda nervous then and asked him to pull over a few blocks from my work, which he wouldn't do and he insisted on taking me to the actual building. I knew he was just trying to find out exactly where it was. I get out of the taxi and he stops me and tells me he's bringing me for drinks. I just laughed awkwardly and went into work. 10 minutes later I get a text saying, hey, it's the taxi driver, a super cute with a winky face. Even worse again, I was on a night out with friends on the same street where I worked and decided I'd get a cab home because it's so late. Get into the cab, everything is fine until we are near my apartment. I was drunk, not gonna lie and even more scared of this guy. He pulled up beside the apartment and then locked the doors. He started asking if he could come up to the apartment with me. He said he'd only take 10 minutes and he'd be finished and leave. It took me about 10 minutes of slurring reasons why it wasn't going to happen, while trying to remain polite so as to not anger him, until he let me out. Then when I was safely behind the locked glass door of the lobby I flipped him off and went upstairs and passed out. The worst thing about cab drivers is you're in a car with them already. I guess it's just scarier the thought that they could just drive off with you. Hence why I was so vigilant about not pissing them off or being rude. So creepy taxi drivers, please try to keep it in your pants. I'll begin by prefacing this story with a short explanation of how a particular taxi service in my city operates. The first few times you call, it's the same tinny waiting music routine, punctuated by short bursts of plastic reassurance. Your call is important to us. Please stay on the line. They call you with an automated message when your taxi arrives, and the pre-recorded woman on the other end speaks over a pseudo-cheerful tune to let you know they're waiting outside. I've also noticed that it's designed to wait for you to say hello before playing the message. If, however, you're like me and almost exclusively call your taxis from a single location, it learns your habits and the call plays out a little differently. The automated voice recites an immediate taxi request template, under the assumption that you're having the regular. Very useful if you're wholly unable to function like a regular human being in the morning, and, let's be honest, afternoon. 
The number of emergency cabs to siphon away my money after missing yet another goddamn bus is lamentable. Here's how the message goes. Welcome, to blank. If you would like to be picked up now, in a standard taxi, at blank, please wait for your order to be confirmed, after pressing 1 now. My strange punctuation highlights the woman's abnormal speech pattern, she speaks as though her individual words have been cobbled together from haphazard sentences. After hanging up, if you don't head outside within a minute or two, the taxi driver himself will call to announce his arrival. It's an efficient system altogether. My personal experience begins at home, on a bright summer afternoon, moments before leaving for work. I'm dashing into every room, scooping up my scattered necessities, and characteristically panicking about the prospect of a punctuality write-up. I hustle out the door and start jogging for the stop when I feel my shots vibrate once. And twice, shit. Phone call. Hello? A short silence hovers on the other end, before snapping suddenly to a voice with familiar inflection. Welcome, to blank. I freeze. Had I ordered a cab? I was fairly certain the bus hadn't come yet. I don't usually call unless I absolutely have to, as my budget contains less than no room for exorbitant taxi rides. I hang up and resume walking, bemused. At work, my co-workers and I share a laugh about ghosts in the machine. At home, my parents slice through the humor to chide me for wasting money so frequently. I put the day behind me, one mildly interesting anecdote richer. A week or so later finds me tapping through pages on my phone in the 2 a.m. dark, sideways in bed and feeling my eyes begin to unfocus. I'm moments from drifting off into tomorrow when sudden vibrations send a massive jolt through my body. I'm startled back into reality. I really wasn't expecting any messages this late, and certainly not a phone call. I stare uncertainty at the screen for a moment, unsure as to whether or not I should answer an unknown number at this hour. The fear of an emergency spurs me to tap the green button and answer in a voice thick with sleep. Hello? A moment passes. A shiver goes through me. I know what's coming an instant before it plays. Welcome, to blank. I hung up. The next day, at precisely the moment I would call if I were late, my phone buzzed. I know the number now. I don't answer. And again the next day. Four calls. Then, nine calls. I tried contacting the company. They show no records of any outgoing calls to my number. Thirteen calls. I got a new SIM card. I changed my number. Forty-four calls. Finally, that night, staring at the animated screen with all the desperate exhaustion of a wounded animal, I decide to finally answer the fucking thing. Welcome, to blank. If you would like to be picked up now, if you would like to be picked up now, if you would like to be picked up now, if you would like to please stay on the stay on the line if you please stay please stay please stay on the call as please stay as important to us please be picked up if you would like to be picked up now. The voice that assaults me is an accelerated, halting patchwork of sound on static that chills me in a way I could never have fathomed moments before. I drop the phone. Do I scream? I can't tell. My head is roaring. I kick it away and leave it on the ground. I don't sleep. The next day, for the first time in many years, I turn it off for good and hide it away in my closet. Adjusting to life without a cell phone is challenging, but I cling to it with relief. The calls stop. I stop looking over my shoulder, snapping at close ones, and slowly cease to feel ghost vibration in my legs every few minutes. I can soon answer the house phone without issue. My sleep pattern readjusts itself and I once again feel comfortable alone at 2 a.m., up in my kitchen, making a late-night sandwich. Or maybe some ramen but I haven't decided yet. I skim our remaining Mr. Noodle flavors as the distant church bells toll when it happens. The house phone rings. A primal nausea grips me as I slowly walk over to the handset. It's 2 a.m. I know that number. I answer and bring it up to my ear, but my throat is paralyzed with fear. I say nothing. I hear nothing but the soft static of a line in use. I stand in my kitchen, frozen and listening. Time passes. I don't know how much. Finally, I choke out my scripted greeting. Hello? Picked up now picked now pick up you like now picked up would you be picked up now would you like please stay now stay you stay now you stay now. The voice is screaming. I hang up, shaking violently, ears ringing. Through tears and blinds I notice movement outside. I make myself peer out the window into the silent street. Sitting in the stillness, its engine purring softly and lights cutting through the thin fog, is my taxi. The phone rings again. I look at it. Different numbers. The driver this time. She's here. It's been about 30 years since I initially became a taxi driver. When I first started, I often got work, I got paid well and there were fewer of us. But now, it's quite pathetic, if I'm honest. I was earning more money 10 years ago than I did now. So I decided that I would retire for good and perhaps even search for a new job. I wasn't sure what I would do, heck, I'm a 65-year-old man who doesn't know any better, so what could I do? 
Little was I to know though that apparently your last day in the taxi industry was a lot more intriguing than most people would tend to think. On the last day, I was sitting in my crappy car on a Saturday afternoon, waiting for work. Yes, waiting. Work was usually very good on a Saturday but not today. No doubt, my employers were punishing me for leaving them, I just presumed. I got my first job in the early evening. I looked at the monitor which displayed where I was to drive to and who my passenger was to be. 33 Snooker Street going to Linsfume, Tony Johnson. 33 Snooker Street? I've only been on Snooker Street a few times during my career, I thought. On top of that, Linsfume was a good hour's drive, so I would have made great money doing that trip. I eagerly put my gear stick in D and set off on my way. Most taxi drivers I knew drove manual but I found automatic cars easy and relaxing, especially in big traffic. When I arrived at Snooker Street, what I saw was a tall, dirty old apartment complex that looked like it was about to collapse any moment now. I sighed and after placing the gear stick in P, I sent a notification to let the passenger know that I was now waiting outside. No doubt the passenger is going to want to talk to me about how my day has been, I thought. I really wasn't in a chatty mood today, but what else could I do? It was expected in the taxi industry that you would at least try to talk to your passengers. Most of them weren't bad people. Sometimes they were annoying, yes, but unless they were extremely drunk, I found the majority of people quite decent. A young, disheveled man left the complex as he glanced around urgently. Could that be my passenger? I wondered. The man appeared to be really agitated, additionally he also seemed to be in a hurry. The disheveled man got into a nearby car and sped away from the vicinity. Wonder what's got his knickers in a twist, I thought. As I waited and waited, I started to grow impatient. Where the hell is my passenger? I looked at my monitor again. Tony Johnson, I read out loud. Usually, I would have just given up by now and cancelled the booking but this was going to be pretty nice pay for me. Thus I left my car, slamming the door on the way out and trotted to the main door of the apartment complex. Number 33, I reminisced about what the monitor had said. I found the number 33 and pressed down on it. I heard a little buzz to let me know that the intercom was active but nobody was answering. Hello, Mr. Johnson, do you ordered a taxi? I spoke into the intercom. Nobody answered. All I heard was a clunk that informed me that the main door was now unlocked. That was very strange. Perhaps, the intercom isn't working from his end, I thought. Maybe he needs help with luggage? I pushed open the main door where I heard it crack. I followed the corridor up the stairs in which I checked the numbers of each apartment. Soon enough I found number 33 on the third floor. I gave a loud knock. Mr. Johnson? The door flew open resulting in me immediately jumping backwards as the hair on the back of my neck prickled. From where I was standing, I looked inside and saw a little girl drawing with crayons on a piece of paper on the floor. I knocked on the door again and cautiously entered but not enough to be considered trespassing. Excuse me, I'm a taxi driver and I'm here to pick up a man. Is that your father? The little girl ignored me and continued to draw with her crayons. She appeared to be drawing pictures of stick men and stick animals. What's your name? I questioned. The little girl looked up at me with piercing blue eyes. Lucy. Does Tony Johnson live here, Lucy? The little girl looked back down at her drawings and continued to scribble away. She gave a gentle nudge with the side of her small head, directing it towards a closed door within the apartment. Thud. 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 What noise was that? Thud. 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 The noise was coming from the room that the little girl claimed Tony Johnson was in. I felt my heart begin to race. I didn't like the sound I was hearing coming from that room, whatsoever. May I come in, Lucy? I asked the little girl anxiously. She just gazed at me with apathetic eyes briefly before looking down again to resume her drawings. I have to make sure Tony is okay, I thought, if he isn't then this poor little girl could be in a lot of trouble. I warily walked into the apartment and carefully stepped around Lucy, making sure to not unsettle her as she practiced her art. I observed the door. Thud. 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 Mr. Johnson? Are you in there? I queried after knocking on the door a few times. I slowly pulled down on the door handle and with a gentle push, I opened the door. And I saw a huge, giant man, twitching and shaking from a noose around his neck, rocking back and forth. I gasped as I staggered backwards. Lucy, I faced the oblivious little girl, who was still scribbling away on a piece of paper. We need to go now, I tried to say as calmly as possible so I didn't alarm her. Then I carefully grabbed her underneath her arms and lifted her, feeling how light she was. Don't worry, I whispered. And Lucy gave a high-pitched shriek almost as if she was a banshee waiting to ambush someone. The sound coming from my mouth was deafening and I struggled to concentrate. Wait, I shouted. I looked into Lucy's face and saw her face had become heavily distorted. 
The piercing blue eyes had turned into little black slits, she had no nose, her smooth skin had become wrinkly and she had razor-sharp teeth protruding from her small mouth. Her mouth then clamped down on my right shoulder, causing me to cry out in pain. I tried to drop her but her bite was so strong that she was practically attached to my shoulder, almost as if she was a humanoid leech. The pain I felt was unbearable. Get off, I screamed. I saw in the corner of my eyes somebody exit the same room where I only recently saw a huge man hanging from a nose. In a fit of adrenaline, I shoved the little girl off and consequently, she took a chunk out of my shoulder as she crashed into nearby furniture. I yelped in pain and I got the fuck out of there. I didn't think my legs were capable of moving so fast. When I got outside, I saw that my shoulder was bleeding profoundly through my jacket. I need the hospital, I thought. I glanced up at the tall apartment complex. That was strange, most of the windows were boarded up, I didn't notice that before. There was only one window that wasn't boarded up and I saw two shadows observing me from above. I sprinted to my car and tried to grab the door handle with my right hand, however my arm decided not to work. So instead I had to use my other hand to open it, afterwards I jumped into the driver's seat, making sure to slam the door with the same hand. As I breathed heavily, I used my left arm to clumsily place my car keys in the lock and twisted it. The car engine made a crackle and shortly afterwards started. I awkwardly put the gear stick in D and grabbed the steering wheel with the same hand, and I sped away. As I drove away, I glanced at the apartment complex and saw two people watching me from the main door. A woman so comely she could have had anything she wanted and the same huge man I thought was dead only minutes ago. The pair of them both had an eerie smile on their pale faces. It sent a shiver down my spine and personally, I don't usually get frightened so easily. I've encountered many drunks who tried to assault me and I've even encountered a man who threatened to stab me, yet seeing those two gave me goosebumps. As I drove down the main road, I noticed that an ambulance was blazing past me with the sirens on. I wonder where it's going, I thought. The ambulance made me consider my own injury, so I parked up and inspected my shoulder. What the hell? My wound was. Gone. There was nothing whatsoever to indicate that anything took a bite out of my shoulder, there wasn't even a little scratch. I then moved my right arm again in a variety of directions to see if it still worked. I was baffled at this point. What happened? I glanced at the monitor which displayed my driving jobs and I saw that my previous job to go to 33 Snooker Street had also mysteriously disappeared. Have I just dreamed everything that's just happened or something? I wasn't even scared at this point, I was just bewildered. Perhaps, I'm going senile? I wondered. My phone started vibrating. Finally. Been trying to get through to you all day, my boss declared. You've been trying to get through to me all day? Yeah, but your phone was off. I thought you wanted to work today? It's your last day, right? Yet you haven't accepted any of the jobs that have come through so I started to wonder what the problem was. I hesitated, not sure what this meant. I'm sorry, boss. On second thought I'm going to retire early. I hung up before my boss could protest and placed my phone in my jacket pocket. My boss was trying to contact me all day but was unable to? I remembered distinctly that I was sitting in this shitty car for the whole afternoon waiting for work. I remembered being assigned a job at 33 Snooker Street. Or did I? I wasn't sure what to believe anymore. It was a better time than any to retire from the taxi industry, so I drove home. This happened when I was 15. Every year, my secondary school would hold a sports day, but because our school didn't have a proper track, we'd always have to go to another school to use their facilities. They held the trials at that other school and I went down with some friends, but because it was raining so badly the trials were cancelled. This was in a totally strange part of the city and I didn't know how to get back, none of the buses went in the direction of my home, so I flagged a cab. Once I stepped into the cab and closed the door, the taxi driver, who was around 40 to 50 years of age maybe? Definitely not younger, began driving, then turned and asked, do you have a boyfriend? I was thinking, whoa, what the hell, but told him no. On the drive, he started telling me about the school I'd been standing outside and how two students from that school had been touching, stroking each other, fingering each other, trying to have sex in his car. He went into so much detail about the kid's genitals that it was pretty clear he was playing out some sick, twisted fantasy of his. Basically he sounded pretty damn horny just talking about it. I was terrified and disturbed by then and chose not to reply, just stared out of the window. Then, at the red light, he asked me to give him my hand. I was in the back seat, but I was really scared he'd do something to me if I didn't, so I did, and he began stroking and rubbing it. After that, he continued with his sex stories about all these students in his cars and their genitals. He asked me for my hand a few more times, I was so freaked out that I let him touch them. 
Then he asked me about my sex life, whether I touched myself, whether I like people touching them, etc, etc, all the while speaking in this low, lustful and horny kind of voice and grinning creepily. Anyway, when we were nearing my home he asked for my name and my number. Gave him a fake name, and said I didn't own a cell phone yet. His response? He smirked creepily at me and went, you're just scared of me, aren't you? That was the worst part he knew he was scaring me. He knew I was scared. When we reached my street I made him drop me off right at the other end of the road so he wouldn't know exactly which house I lived in, and as I was paying him he made me give him my hand again, after which he started rubbing and squeezing my hand and wrists for an inordinately long time. When I got out I waited till the car was out of sight before walking back to my house, rattled. Perhaps I was kind of naive for giving him my hand, but I didn't want to anger him so he could drive me into some foreign part of the city and do unspeakable things to me or something, yeah, I'm always assuming the worst. When my father found out about what happened he told his friend about it, she's the manager of that very cab company, coincidentally, and it's actually a pretty reputable company, and she fired him immediately, turns out he admitted to the harassment. A few years ago, my mother and I had an encounter with a rather unusual taxi driver. I stayed involved in Girl Scouts until the very last year. Since most girls quit Scouts after elementary or middle school, our senior troop was very small, only about six girls. We had worked hard all year fundraising, and one of the moms was a travel agent, so she got us a great deal on a cruise for all the girls and moms. We visited a couple of the US Virgin Islands. This story takes place on ST Martin. My mom and I had gone off to explore on foot, and had a great time. Secluded trails, a butterfly sanctuary, and we got a good laugh when we stumbled across a nude beach. It was getting time to head back. There were a bunch of taxis near the entrance to the beach not traditional yellow taxis, mostly personal vehicles with signs on them indicating they were taxis. One driver noticed us looking around and hollered, hey, looking for a ride? Nothing suspicious about him at first glance. He was a tall, thin, dark-skinned fellow with an impressive set of dreadlocks and a white toothy smile. We told him we were heading to the dock, and hopped in his car. The ride went pretty smoothly, but the guy took the long way. He drove along all sorts of back roads, telling us how much he loved living on the island. Almost every little house or shack we drove by, he would point and exclaim, my friend Stacy lives here, and tell us something about them. He shattered the whole way, but it was all happy, friendly chatter and I certainly didn't mind getting another look at the beautiful landscape. After a while, though, my mom nudged me and gave me an odd look. That's when I realized that we'd been driving for like 15 or 20 minutes. The dock wasn't that far away, maybe a 5 minute drive maximum. This guy was obviously driving in circles. Are we getting pretty close? My mom asked. We have to be back on the ship at such and such time, or they'll leave without us. No problem, the driver answered cheerfully. I just like to take the scenic route. These cruise people don't let you look around. Do you miss the best parts of the island? He went back to telling stories, as though he was oblivious to our growing discomfort. Oh, fantastic, I thought. We've been tricked into a fake taxi and now it's taking us god knows where. Was he a serial killer? Human trafficker? Just a random lunatic? As I was quietly panicking, the driver stopped abruptly on the side of the road. I looked across my mom and out her window. I could see the ship. We were a block away from the dock. He had actually taken us where we were supposed to go. We scrambled out of the car, and the driver climbed out as well. How much do we owe you? My mom asked. Oh, don't worry about it. No money, said the driver. Maybe I could have a hug? He stretched his long, skinny arms out wide. Uh, okay? My mom and I gave him an awkward side hug, one on each side. He laughed heartily and said, you lovely ladies have a nice day. Then he got back in his taxi and left. To this day, we can't figure out what that guy's deal was. He didn't try to hurt us, and even though charging a hug for a taxi ride is pretty weird, it didn't come off as a lewd or sexual request at all. He just took us on a joyride and told stories. He couldn't have been a real taxi driver, because he didn't charge us money and he parked a block away from the docks, making me think he didn't want anyone to catch him doing this. Maybe he was just some weird, lonely guy who wanted someone to hang out with. Maybe he fancied himself an unofficial tour guide. Maybe he'd had bad intentions, but then had a change of heart. I don't know. This wasn't really a scary encounter. It's actually a fun story that I recall fondly. But I never forget all the ways it could have turned out very, very badly. Whenever and wherever you go on vacation, be careful. We got lucky. I imagine that most people who pose as taxi drivers to trick unsuspecting tourists don't have such innocent intentions. Unofficial taxi man. Dot you turned out to be pretty cool, but all the same, let's not meet again.